Hi there, this is Jack from technologywithintention.com. Since my last post, I've received some questions and seen others out on Twitter and various other social networks. People asking, yeah, flipped instruction is great, but what can it do for me? I'm not a math teacher. So this is a, a time-shifted lecture. I'm recording in a program called Explain Everything. I'm going to be going over 10 different ways that you can use flipped instruction in non-math classrooms. Everything in this video is created within Explain Everything, with the exception of these buttons here. If you'd like to jump straight to a specific discipline, you can do so now. Otherwise, the video will run through and give you 10 examples of flipped instruction beyond the math classroom. Thanks. This is an example of using flipped instruction in a language arts classroom we're going to diagram the following sentence. Elliot's friend found three blue beetles. Start with step one. What is the verb in this sentence? Found. And the subject, who found? Well, that would be a friend. And the object, what did the friend find? A beetle. And we can look for any possessives. A uh, hint for possessives might be looking for uh, some punctuation that suggests possession. I think I see something right here. So that's Elliot's friend. Finally, are there any adjectives here that describe Elliot or describe what was found? Yes, so there is three blue beetles. So screencasting software can be used here to explain a concept, it can be used to explain an example, and it, in explaining an example it doesn't have to be a teacher. A student could actually go ahead and diagram the sentence and then send the video to the teacher, uh, talking through their thought process as they go. This gives teachers insight into how the homework was done, or how the work was done, as opposed to just a right or a wrong answer. Flipped instruction in the music class. So many great applications. Think about polyrhythms. Think about scales. Think about introducing concepts uh, that students might want to listen to, practice, or review before they stand in front of 20 or 30 other students and attempt it. Uh, here's an example using uh, ukulele tuning. I've got a treble clef here with four notes. If I was doing this in the classroom, my students and I might make some... Uh, some inferences based on what we see here. Uh, for instance, this first note here, which is G, seems higher up on the staff than C. So maybe the first string of my ukulele will be higher than the second. I also notice a relationship between the first and second note there. It looks like just a whole step. And I see that the pitch is, um, is getting higher from C up. So let's test out. G, C, C is lower than G. E A, okay? So students can take a listen to that and they can check for understanding. I mean, imagine if you have students doing vodcasting, right? They could write their own music. They could be discussing the differences between eighth notes and quarter notes. They can be looking at rests. Uh, they could be writing out scales and singing. You could have one student write uh, or compose some music and a second student perform it. And the first student can go back and discuss whether uh, they, they had composed accurately. Endless opportunities in the music classroom. Flipped instruction in a history class. This is actually a lot of fun. People do this with smart boards all the time. I've got three inventions here and I'm talking to students about um, when they were invented. So first we've got the Model T, beautiful car there. We've got crayons that were invented in the early 1900s and zippers. Okay, so using um, the audio and visual capabilities of screencasting, I can discuss these as much as I'd like. So crayons, an important invention, 1903. I'm going to put them on the timeline right about there. Uh, Model T was first sold in 1908, so that's about there. And then the zipper invented in 1913, although not patented until much later. You can imagine students playing with this, discussing, 
um, recording the results and then turning in uh, the, the finished product to the teacher. Flipped instruction in a class about uh, communication skills or about public presentations or even just visual design. You know, when designing a slide, um, there's a bunch of theory that can go into this that allow us to pre-attentively process some of the information on the page. So I can have students review this slide prior to uh, arriving in class, and then we can have a conversation around the skills and the concepts present rather than just going over them. So I can see that right here, uh, all of these words are big. Um, so that sort of suggests that they are important and that they maybe frame the rest of the work. I also see horizontal rules on the slide going this way. And that suggests that the information horizontally is related to one another. Therefore, email is probably related to these three lines here. Because they're three lines, I'm going to assume they're three separate ideas related to email. What does everything have in common? Well, it's probably the big words at the top of the page. Screencasting software can be used in general learning support. For instance, I'm checking for fluency with a student. If there's a passage here, and I can have the student read and underline the words as they do so. As a teacher, at a later time, I'm going to go ahead and review the video and listen to understand um, where the student uh, has challenges in regards to punctuation and or spelling. So here's an example. When he expected change, none came. This had always been true. It could have become an excuse, a reason, a crutch. As a teacher, I can review the footage and understand how a student is tracking words, along with seek out any instances that might suggest uh, processing issues or dyslexia. Flipped instruction in a visual arts classroom. You can go over some basic concepts or vocabulary so that when students get to class, they can implement that into their discussion as opposed to just understanding. You can talk about, let's move this to the front, we can talk about focal point. You know, it seems as though here's the focal point of this picture. Okay, let's move that one out of the way. We can talk about uh, positive and negative space by bringing this one to the front. So looking at this image, we can see uh, that it deals with lines and light and dark. And we can figure out, you know, well, it looks like about, I don't know, a third of the image is probably taken up with dark, maybe half the image, and the rest is light. Uh, what kind of lines are going on here? Well, we've got diagonals and we've got horizontals. Um, but there's really nothing that's truly on axis. Get this guy out of the way. Let's take a look at our final photograph. Maybe here we're talking about color and lines. Or we can talk about effects. We can talk about the rule of thirds in this image. It seems as though the curtain takes up a third or two-thirds of the page. Why is that? I can use flipped instruction in a technology class. An example might be building a website. and I want students to have a basic understanding of HTML structure before they arrive at class for the day. So here I've got an image and I'm going to go ahead and refer to the image. Um, in HTML5 uh, there's two, three main sections that need to be understood. HTML tags always begin and end with crocodiles. And the first tag that's important to know is head tag. Just like a body, this is uh, what goes on behind the scenes and it tells the web browser information that should be stored to control the rest of the page. That might be a title. It may be the way that certain tags should look. It may have a JavaScript library. The second main part of an HTML5 document would be the body. The body is what contains most of the stuff. It's typically the biggest chunk. Um, so in the body I have all sorts of different kinds of information and it's all doing different things and it all lives in the body tag. And finally in HTML5, uh, one tag that didn't exist previously is footer. So 
always nice to have a footer at the bottom of your page. It explains any copyright information. It keeps the page grounded. Flipped instruction in a community service class or even for planning a field trip. You know, let's say that we're doing trash pickup in our neighborhood. Okay, I can just go ahead and have the students know the area that they will be focused on prior to the class starting. So I don't have to spend the first 15 minutes of a 45 minute class showing the students or trying to verbally explain where they should go. So for this trash cleanup I'm going to have the fourth grade we're going to be working uh, right here in this quadrant and that's everything just uh, east of the school and then we'll have the sixth grade you guys have class today so let's have you take the two blocks here and um, remember Please don't use the alley, stick to the streets, and stick with a buddy. Flipped instruction has great value in foreign language classes. It can allow teachers to explain concepts in class that can be reviewed later for homework. Students that were absent for a day can still follow along and learn what happened in the lecture. Here's an example. Uh, let's say we're taking a basic Mandarin Chinese class, and we want to learn the word for big, which is da. This is how it would be written in English, but there's a specific stroke order for the character in Mandarin Chinese. So using screencasting, I can explain as I talk. One, two, three. I can actually use the pen to order those. One, two, three. Flipped instruction in health class, maybe reviewing concepts maybe that you've, uh, you've discussed for the day. Um, here is uh, the Department of Agriculture's uh, response to the food pyramid. It's the food plate. And students and I take a look and we see, you know, wow, they say that half of what you eat on your plate should be fruits and veggies. Look at that. And half should be grains and proteins. Looks like I should have more grains than proteins looking at this uh, pie chart here. And look at that, dairy's off to the side. Dairy is something else. It's, uh, it's a complement to a meal. It shouldn't be my main meal. 